Thank you for taking 10 minutes out of your Thursday to watch CNN Student News. I'm Carl Azus at the CNN Center. Our first story centers on a state of emergency in the East African nation of Ethiopia. This is one of the poorest countries on the planet. More than 29% of Ethiopia's people are estimated to live below the poverty line. The nation's economy has grown rapidly in recent years, but that's coincided with a rise in ethnic tension. Why? Well, the country has a diverse combination of ethnic groups. The largest, the Oromo ethnic group, makes up about a third of Ethiopia's population. Another, the Amaras, make up 27%. The Tigrays make up just over 6%. But the smaller Tigray ethnic group reportedly dominates the government, and that's one reason why some other groups are protesting. The government declared a state of emergency recently in response to the loss of lives and property in the protests, but signs of instability remain. The Ethiopian government in Addis Ababa introduced a state of emergency in the country because of growing concerns about security following several protests this is the first time a state of emergency has been declared in Ethiopia in the last 25 years. The death of at least 52 people in a religious festival has led to increased ethnic tensions within the country. The activists claim that at least 500 people were killed, but the government denies this. This comes after one of Ethiopia's largest ethnic groups has been fiercely protesting against the government. The Oromos make up over a third of the country's 100 million population, and yet none of Ethiopia's past or current leadership has come from the Oromo region. Protests started in April 2014 when the government announced plans to expand the capital Addis Ababa into Oromo territory. Although the government abandoned these plans, the protests have snowballed. At the 2016 Olympics, the Ethiopian runner Faisa Lilesa crossed the finishing line with his hands raised and his wrists touching as if they were handcuffed. This has become a powerful protest about the treatment of the Oromo people by the government. The government of Ethiopia, in trying to stop the Oromos from protesting too much, are forgetting that the Amaras and the Tigres also want a slice of power. It's very difficult for a government that's been used for the last 25 years to no opposition within parliament to actually face up the fact that this may actually be splintering into a serious ethnic fight within Ethiopia. In northern Iraq, a battle is looming. Iraqi troops, with the support of U.S. forces, are planning an attempt to retake the city of Mosul from the ISIS terrorist group. Mosul is the second largest city in Iraq. ISIS took control of it in 2014. Officials believe the terrorists are planting mines and explosives around the city to complicate the fight. The lasting damage that ISIS has left in towns near Mosul could be a sign of what's to come. A lake of fire, thick black clouds obscuring the sun in the town of El Gayara, south of Mosul. ISIS set this oil well on fire months ago. The purpose was to obscure the view of aircraft overhead. But ISIS is now gone and this fire continues to burn right on the edge of a town in which many people are now living. <laughs> And in its shadow lives Khalil, who takes us to his house somewhere in the midday darkness. The smoke is stained two-year-old Arbeda and his sisters. Khalil and his wife cover the children with a sheet at night, scant protection from the toxic fumes. That well is really hurting us, Khalil says. The wind has changed direction and now it's all blowing on us. He says they have nowhere else to go. We could barely stay with him for 10 minutes. Engineer Hossein Salem and his team are trying to put out the dozens of fires, but it's a time-consuming process. It took 30 days to put out one fire, he says. In the main street, some shops have reopened. Also here, the smoke hangs heavily on residents. It's another ISIS, says Shalan. It's cancer. Daesh, as they call ISIS here, left behind a poisonous legacy of death, destruction and disease. The World Health Organization, part of the United Nations, is asking governments worldwide to put a new tax on sodas. It wants soft drink prices increased by at least 20%. Public health experts say sugar, like what's found in many soft drinks, 
is mostly to blame for rising global obesity rates. The WHO says 39% of the planet's adults were overweight in 2014, and that a new tax on sugary drinks would prevent obesity and diabetes and cut health care costs. But would higher prices mean lower calorie choices when people want something to drink? That seems to be true in some places, like the city of Berkeley, California. A voter-approved tax there reportedly led to a 21% drop in the consumption of sugary beverages. But results haven't been the same everywhere. The nation of Mexico put a 10% tax on sugary drinks in 2013. And the Wall Street Journal reports that those sales decreased at first, they started rising again recently. The U.S. beverage industry says that the Mexican tax put a burden on those who could least afford it and that it caused thousands of jobs to be lost in Mexico's soft drink industry. Up next, science and agriculture. Some researchers are looking beyond pesticides, beyond genetically modified seeds. Instead, they're literally coating seeds with bacteria in the pursuit of growing more crops and better crops. The process is still being tested. It's not definitively proven to work. There are still questions about safety for consumers. But one of the companies testing microbiomes believes they're the future of agriculture. How are we going to feed what is estimated to be 10 billion people by 2050? To get there, we need to increase our current productivity by about 70 percent. The ability to achieve that with our current rates of genetic gain and yield improvement are not achievable. And so we need to look for new ways. We also need to do it in a way that's sustainable. For decades, innovations in agriculture have allowed our food supply to keep pace with population growth. But at what cost? The technologies that have given rise to the productivity improvements we've seen in agriculture are generally things like agricultural chemicals, chemical fertilizers, things that arguably aren't good for us and aren't good for the planet. What if there was a better way? A startup called Indigo is attempting to create a more productive and more natural way to grow crops without the agricultural chemicals, a method that could revolutionize the industry. We attempt to solve that problem by harnessing the plant's natural microbiome, the microbes that evolved over millennia, really, to improve the health of plants. What is a microbiome exactly? Well, in humans, the microbiome is a community of microorganisms that includes the bacteria naturally occurring in and on our bodies, the bad bacteria, but also the good bacteria that help with important functions like digestion and reproduction. The basis of what we do at Indigo is a realization that that same concept is true in plants. Those same beneficial microbes live in and on plants and until recently weren't fully understood. But rapidly developing technologies like gene sequencing have allowed scientists to realize the full potential of the plant microbiome. According to Indigo, the microbiome could be the key to growing natural super crops. We've actually tested in all different climate conditions, and we consistently see a 10 plus percent yield benefit. A 10 percent increase would be a whole decade leap forward in terms of productivity. The innovations that we've had that have gotten us to now have been really important. Without those innovations, we wouldn't have been able to feed the last billion people. We can now do better. And I think, you know, the future of agriculture, we'll look back and think about the times when we put insecticides on hundreds of millions of acres and think, you know, thank goodness we don't have to do that anymore. Officials in Little Rock, Arkansas called their city's Broadway Bridge structurally deficient. This is how it got revenge. Cuts to the bridge, explosive charges, and 93 years of age could not bring it down. Officials are working to replace the structure, but they needed to remove it first. It took six more attempts, pulling the bridge with cables from two towboats before the steel finally came crashing down. Makes you wonder why they don't make all bridges this tough. After all, its strength spanned decades. All that time it could be trusted. Even though gravity was its arch enemy, it took blasts and boats to cause the causeway to give way. And all that actually happened over several hours. You just saw the abridged version. I'm Carl Azus. We're back tomorrow.